Somebody asked me once, they said, you know, to you, what does everything falling apart look like? You know, if you had to describe, what does it mean for the culture to fall off the cliff? Uh, my answer was, you can't get electricity, you can't get fuel, and you can't get grain. If you can't get grain, fuel, or electricity, things will come to a screeching halt. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments, $20, $10, and $5 Gold Liberty Coins, a true piece of Americana. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest we haven't had very often. He is Joel Salatin. He's a teacher, lecturer, writer, activist farmer, co-founder of Polyface Farms, and editor of the Stockman Grass Farmer. He's here with us this Tuesday, August 14, 2021. Joel, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Thank you, Dunnigan. It's a real, it's a, always a treat to be with you. We've sought you out way back in the beginning. You, we were referred to you actually by uh, one of our recurring guests who's been with us about his own personal homestead journey as a expert that he followed the advice of on how to get started in homesteading. It's been a increasingly interesting topic to so many people who are losing trust in the big systems, the big grocery store chains, the big governmental policies or anything else, uh, FDA or whatever, that as being the source of their food or their source of uh, trustworthy regulations to keep their food safe or anything. There's so many reasons people are trying to become more self-reliant and you've been a big part of that for many people. And I understand you've just got a brand new book out, just came out. Can you tell us about that and how it can help people on a small scale? Sure. You know, uh, Dunnigan, back, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago or so when I began um, being noticed and asked to speak at conferences and things, <clears throat> I'd get done. I'd get done with the presentation and people would come and say, oh, that's, that's cute and it's sweet, but but how does it scale up? And today the farm has grown, you know, to, to a, a much, much larger place. And um, now when I get done, the most common reaction is, well, that's amazing, that's awesome, but I've only got five acres, how does it scale down? And so, you know, I always write to the, you know, kind of the, the hot buttons that I'm hearing um, uh, just out there. And uh, so that, that has become a real hot button here in the last, you know, four or five years with this, what I call a homesteading tsunami, as people uh, do indeed, uh, you know, vacate vacate the city or, or for that matter, even um, you know, turn their turn their suburban you know backyard into into a, a grocery store, um, and, and so uh, I've I've written this book um, and it's just fresh off uh, Polyface Micro. So it's it's you know it's it's us at a tiny scale. Polyface Micro. The subtitle is Success with Livestock on a Homestead Scale, and I even have a chapter in there on how to have chickens and rabbits in a Manhattan apartment. So when I say, you know, when I say, um, you know, livestock on a homestead scale, uh, I mean, you know, uh, we're going to take this down to as small as possible and and make it so people can have hygienic, uh, sanitary, unsmelly, um, uh, great livestock, even in a a very, very small uh, situation. And so, uh, so yeah, we're, we, we've got that, um, we just got it back from the printers last week, and through September, we're running a we're running a special here of, of five dollars off the cover price plus an autograph. So, anything we sell through September, I'll autograph it, and you can have five bucks off, and then it'll go to cover price starting October one, and and we'll release it to we'll release it to um, you know to Amazon and and bookstores uh, starting January one. But you know, w- once you're an entrepreneurial marketer, you want to. Um, you want to you want to see that in every facet of life, and so, you know, I've got a, <clears throat> I've got not a huge but a, a a very loyal fan base, and so uh, marketers call this creaming the market early on, and then we'll release it to the masses uh, later. Ah, well, you know, actually, we did an interview with you uh, over a year ago, uh, a year and a half, called "Feed Your Family on Zero Acres." 
So I think you were already well in the way of, uh, you know, talking about strategies for doing that. But it sounds like you've you've even developed additional approaches. Uh, maybe you could you could share a few nuggets uh, from the book that whet people's appetite for for looking further. Sure. Yeah. So so a few a few nuggets. Um, uh, so let, let's take it down to the lowest to to a. A, a tiny scale. Say you don't even have a yard, you know, uh, or, or or your yard is literally a, a postage stamp. Well, you know, um, we're known here for for pastured poultry. We're going to run our you know animal uh, animals outside. But you know, if if you've got a postage stamp yard that's you know uh, whatever you know thirty feet by twenty feet or something, um, you don't want to run pastured poultry because your kids would be tracking manure into the house all day. You don't want that. There's just not enough not enough room for the you know volleyball net and and and, and chickens out there. So uh, in those in those really really cramped kind of situations, the there there are two two ways nature sanitizes or, or creates a hygienic environment with animals. One is with um, rest and sunshine, which is the pasture, the movement. You know, you're moving them all the time and fresh ground, that sort of thing, giving, you know, a rest period. So rest and sunshine, those are the, the and movement, you know, that that's one way. But the second way is a compost pile. Nothing, nothing purifies, sanitizes, you know, cleans up uh, like a, like a compost pile. Even, I mean, it even breaks down antibiotics and, 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 uh, you know, all sorts of pathogens and, and things. And so, um, so in the book, I and we do this on our farm whenever we house, and there are times when you want to house livestock. I mean, you know, when we have a, a, a 12-foot snow in the winter, uh, pastured chickens are you know not very happy outside. So so there are absolutely times when you want to house um, animals, and so when we do that, we do a very deep deep bedding underneath them. So essentially, the animals are on a compost pile. And 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 that that has to be deeper than you know three or four inches. Just like a compost pile has to have a certain amount of of mass, you know, width, height, uh, length, you know, volume, in order generally, you know, a, a, a yard by a yard by a yard, in order to have enough core to um, you know to maintain the biological community of the compost pile. And so, if you're going to create a a, 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 um, a bedding situation uh, that mimics a compost pile. You know, it's got to be 12 to 16 inches deep. And so if you do that uh, with wood chips or sawdust or bark mulch or some, anything that's, that, that, that's carbonaceous and brown, uh, and especially like for chickens that, could be, that can be scratched and moved around, you know, um, straw is problematic because it mats. So you want something that, that, that has pieces that are friable enough that chickens can scratch around so, so they can aerate it. That keeps the decomposition going, oxygen uh, to aerate it, and then enough carbon to, to uh, metabolize the nitrogen that they're putting down from their manure. And that essentially creates an underneath compost pile that doesn't smell and, and is, um, is hygienic for the birds, even in a you know, a, a, a five foot by four foot, a five foot by four foot spot. I mean, something that would be no bigger than the size of a of a large terrarium, for example. Um, you know, you can actually have, you know, three or four chickens in there. They can eat all of your kitchen scraps. Now you don't have the garbage to go out, and they turn that that garbage into eggs, and uh, and you have a very uh, uh, cycling, you know, uh, self feeding, self sustaining system. I have to give a personal testimony. The same individual who was for his family starting to raise both egg laying and meat chickens, uh, starting bee beekeeping for honey and on and on like that, who got us, who, who directed us to you years ago, to you. Uh, he took us out the backyard of his house where he had an attractive little wooden shed there he had built as a chicken coop and to show us his egg laying hens that li lived out there. And we were bracing ourselves for you know stench of of ammonia smelling chicken manure or whatever and there was no odor and he had the deep bedding exactly as you described it and uh so 
I, I can I can attest to that because there was a whale of a difference between that and earlier exposures I've had to chicken coops in my day. That uh, very different experience. That, that's right, and yeah, and so so the whole book. So you know that's just uh, that's just you know uh, whatever. I mean, I have I have one chapter devoted to this to this deep bedding concept because it is it is so revolutionary, and and you never see it addressed or used in. In the the typical, you know, homesteader garden way type, not not to take away from them, but what I've tried to do in this book is is address all the issues that I wish that I knew or saw in the homesteading books that I've seen, and um, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, a section on, for example, how to how to have how to get clean eggs. I mean, uh, there's everything from you know egg eaters to uh, thin shells and uh, cracked and broken and manure eggs and all this stuff, and so there's you know I, I, I address very very practically you know how to do that. The, you know the, one of the, one of the best one of the most important uh, facets is to make sure the nests the nest boxes are always above chicken eye height, uh, so that the chicken can't just mischievously go in there without actually having a, a destination place to want to go. Uh, if it's out of it's a, if it's out of eyesight, it's not as tempting for her to fool around in there and break eggs and things as as um, as it is when it's down you know low to the ground. And so you know these are all things that that I, I you know I've been on <laughs> I don't countless um, you know homesteads, and these are all things that that I see. Um, and so I've tried to address all those little you know those little things that. Um, that I see as, as problems that people are struggling with uh, as they try to have animals on a very small scale. So this book is not yet fully released. This is fresh off the press. If people want to get, get their hands on it. Oh, it, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not available on Amazon yet. It's available. We're, it, it's available through our, um, through our, our gift shop at Polyface, you know, just uh, Polyface farms. And if you just, you know, type in P O L Y about P O L Y F. <laughs> it'll it'll come right up, and uh, and yeah, we're running this special through September to encourage folks to to go ahead and grab it. And you know, and I'm I'm autographing um, you know a couple hundred a day here. Um, but but you know, come, come October one, we'll you know we'll uh, go on up to cover price and stop autographing, and then come January one, it'll be available in you know at Amazon and bookstores and things like that. But another thing that you've talked about with us in the past is about how people we said uh, making your dream homestead dreams come true on zero zero dollars per acre. You talked to us about the eagerfarmer dot com and about the aging demographic of farmers and different different creative strategies. There's a question from Tim Sandman who says, Joel, how does one get a small holding or a farm without sizable funds to buy the land? Okay, um, such a great question. And again, I, I address this uh, in the book, but um, the the primary thing is to look around at acreages that are available in in your community. Uh, there you may you may know a farmer, and many farmers are sixty years old and their kids have left, and they're desperate for some uh, second pair of hands. You could you could trade a uh, you know trade some some off time work uh for for acreage and one of the nice things about the kind of um uh, whatever infrastructure that we use with you know electric fence and portable infrastructure is that you you don't have to um have it on a on acreage that you own or at least at least the the main part of it you know if you own what i call a hub uh, you know where you live, maybe have your garden, and maybe have a a corral or or some winter quarters or something, maybe a hoop house, um, and and you know, that you don't need very much for that. I mean th- that can be an acre uh, or two, very very small, and then you can get access to acreages in the acreage in the community. As a stack on uh, permaculture uses the term stacking a lot to describe 
you know, vertical diversification on a landscape. So, for example, if you know somebody who has an orchard, uh, you could run chickens under that orchard or geese or ducks or lambs uh, or, you know, sheep. Um, I wouldn't recommend goats or cows because they're, they're problematic. Cows are too heavy and goats and all the, and all the bark. And I wouldn't recommend pigs because they'll, you know, root up and, and expose the little root hairs. So there's, um, there, so there's, there's a lot of, of potential as long as you have um, symbiotic relationships, you know, where uh, somebody doesn't, doesn't um, where you're not going to hurt a mother ship. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly anybody that's got cattle and has pasture, I mean, you can stack any number of, of other enterprises on there. I mean, we had a neighbor that, that had some, just some brambles in, in the edge of some fields, and, um, and he let us use them to run pigs in. And we just mm. uh, we just you know took the chainsaw and, and whacked some some uh, enough we could snake an electric fence through there and and uh, over two or three years the pigs took out all of his brambles turned it into grass and he was thrilled to death and free land um, so you know there there are just a tremendous number of these kind of uh, symbiotic opportunities in the community when you start when you actually are serious about it. You put attention on it, you know. Turn off Netflix, and, and, and put attention on it, and, uh, and and start investing time and attention in relationships, uh, you know, w- with with people who either have or can put you in touch with people who have available acreage. I mean, I know I need I know a guy in California that got started on some land trust land. So this was green space that had been isolated up um, around uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, and they were desperate for something to happen on there. And so this young couple, you know, started a pastured poultry enterprise uh, on on a, a, a green space trust land. So anyway, there's, there, there's a lot of opportunity out here if you're willing to be creative and look at what I call you know, nooks and crannies, nooks and crannies that aren't being used from, from vacant lots to field edges to, um, to, to, to stacking um, uh, some complementary enterprise on an, existing, uh, on an existing acreage. If uh, somebody has timberland or land that is not being uh, agriculturally farmed for you know, food crops, uh, can pigs run in that as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, you know, that's generally what we use for, for pigs. You just have to remember with pigs that this is fairly land extensive. Pigs can, pigs can do a lot of damage. I mean, of all the animals, uh, I mean, the herbivores can overgraze and, and, and that sort of thing, but, but only the pig, you know, with all the different kinds of livestock, only the pig can really, um, what we call tear up things, you know, dig to China and make divots and, and really make a, what I call a moonscape. Um, and, and we don't want a moonscape, and your landlord doesn't want a moonscape. So you just have to remember that when you start down this thing with pigs, um, it is land extensive. You know, we, we run uh, uh, 10 pigs per acre in a rotation. So um, now we run, we run batches a lot bigger than that, but, but it comes out to roughly uh, 10, 10 pigs per acre. Uh, that we're that we're growing, you know, in a year. That's only ten pigs per acre, uh, and that acre would be divided into, you know, about uh, seven or eight divisions. So you're looking at, you know, a little eighth of an acre, eighth of an acre uh, spots that you're moving the pigs around through, and um, and so, but you know, I mean, for a homesteader, ten pigs is a lot. In fact, you know, five pigs is probably a lot. Uh, and, and in the book, I, I, I talk about um, what a homesteader can market before you become a marketer. Um, in, in my experience, almost anybody can can sell from their back porch w- without any marketing. Just you know, on the QT with you know friends and associates and stuff. Basically, off your back porch, you can sell you know, like thirty dozen eggs a week. You can sell you know five hogs a year. You know three beef. Um, you know three lambs. Uh, you know, there's there, there's a fair amount of stuff that you can do, uh, it, it, and if you go over that, then you actually you know become a business. And and I'm I, I love to see homesteaders become um, you know turn their thing into a business. A lot of businesses do be, do you know actually um, 
develop as a result of kind of a, a hobby kind of thing. But uh, there are plenty of people who would just like to, you know, keep their, you know, keep their job and, uh, and just do the homesteading kind of on the side. And that's, that's great, too. There's a question here that's a follow-up from the same uh, questioner, Tim Sandman. Also, generally speaking, how many acres would one need to be self-sufficient for a family of six? Well, we've, all the, we've, we've talked about things all the way from zero acres up to very different methods. So it, a lot of assumptions would go into answering that question, but just any general guidelines on uh, trying to feed a modest, moderate-sized family uh, on a homestead with the techniques that you're describing in your book, for example. Yeah. Well, as soon as soon as you move to um, to beef cattle or a or a milk cow, which uh, you know a family of six would be uh, highly recommended. Um, I mean, obviously, depending on where you live, makes a big difference. I mean, if you're in a if you're in Nevada, it's going to take a lot more acreage if you don't have irrigation than if you live in uh, you know Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, so you know, generally east of the Mississippi, um, to have self-sufficient livestock for a family of six, east of east of the Mississippi, as and a general rule of thumb, it's probably going to take about you know about five acres. Um, if you're if you're in brittle land, you know where rainfall is under under 20 inches, you know you need to start thinking about probably tripling it. Simply, uh, unless you have unless you have water rights and you have irrigation, I would just add though you know having said that, that remember you know if you if you do have five acres of, of pasture let's say uh, where you could have say a milk cow and 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 a steer a year um, or two you know maybe you could have you know three three bovines of some some sort um, just remember that that same acreage can be used for uh, on five acres you know you could grow 2500 broiler chickens um, so that, that's why I, I, I prefaced my answer with saying you know it depends on if you want something uh, uh, either beef or milk cow of, of a bovine strain because that's going to that's going to create you know a, a little bit larger acreage and if you're just wanting to be self-sufficient in for example chickens and turkeys uh, then you know you could you could do that on you know on an acre, um, but as soon as you go into the larger herbivore, it's going to take a little more land. Now milk cows, it's interesting because more and more people are coming out with uh, you know different types of insensitivities and their uh, sensitivities to uh, food, and uh, goat's milk is often suggested as an alternative. Uh, so from a nutritious standpoint, but also from a land and density standpoint and usage, do goats for milking give you uh, what you need with less land needs than a cow would? All right. <laughs> I have a whole half chapter devoted to this uh, question, so let me just give it to you in a, in a bullet form. Here, here's the thing. The beauty of goats is uh, that, yes, they are a smaller animal, and, and generally speaking, when you the, the smaller the animal, the more production per acre. So that's a rule of thumb. The smaller the animal, more production per acre. In other words, uh, you know, a, a sheep gives you more production per acre than a cow. Uh, a, a um, you know, a chicken or, or a turkey uh, more than a sheep. A chicken more than a turkey. A guinea pig more than a chicken. And if you really want to, you know, get production, you can go to escargot, uh, you know, and and be real small. But the other rule of thumb along with that, though, is that the smaller the animal, the more labor is required per acre. So on extensive acreages, that's where the, the larger animal uh, is, is, is beneficial because you can, actually, you can actually manage a much larger acreage with less labor with the larger animal, which is why, you know, rangelands and things, it, 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 you know, that, that, that was... That was more um, bison and and large herbivores. Um, as you as you come into uh, you know intensity of production, then you go into a smaller animal. Now, so that that gets us to the goat. And um, here's the here's the the beauty of the goat is that they will eat almost anything, as every, anybody knows. 
The problem with a goat is that they are primarily browsers. So a goat wants to eat about 80% of their intake from above their shoulders. So they're, you know, they're nipping off things. They're reaching up. You know how goats do. I mean, they stand on their hind legs and bend over things, and they're, they're reaching. They're going uh, up high. That's because their digestive system wants a more, um, a more cellulitic structure than a sheep. A sheep is a, a sheep wants eighty percent below their shoulders, you know, uh, grass and clover and things like that, and only twenty percent above their shoulders. Now, the energy cycle, the energy cycle of woody, brambly, thistly, you know, uh, um, higher species than forages. The energy cycle for brushy, woody type stuff is about three times longer than the energy cycle for forages. In other words, when, when, a, when a grass or a clover plant gets pruned, whether it's mowed or grazed, when it gets pruned, it recuperates in, let's just say, X amount of time. When a multiflora rose or autumn olive or a privet bush or, or something, when, 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 when a woody species, a, a brushy, brambly type of thing, a weed, gets defoliated, it takes 3x as long to recuperate. This is why goats routinely are purchased to, you know, deal with honeysuckle, brambles, brow, you know, uh, rough kind of conditions. And over time, they kill the woody uh, type species, and you get this beautiful clover and grass and things like that. And so the the joke about goats is it takes about five years for two things to happen. One, for the goats to eat themselves out of their habitat because they gradually kill they kill the browse and it converts to, you know, nice lush forages underneath. So it takes about five years for that for them to eat themselves out of their habitat and it takes about five years for you to begin liking your goats. <laughs> and so just so the conundrum is just at the time when you really start to like your goats you feel comfortable with them you can control them you can keep them in you know what they you know you know their nuances you you know you you really you know uh, get familiar with your goats right at that point now you're going to turn them into a grazer and not a browser and at that point you start they start eating everything below their shoulders and it's too rich then you get mastitis you get prolapsed uterus you get uh um you know sore hooves all sorts of things because they're they're eating too uh, uh too rich a diet too much ice cream and so that's the conundrum with goats and so um you know all the people all the people that I know who have been long-term successful with goats have started on their own place to you know do a land healing conversion kind of thing and then they end up moving the goats renting the goats to neighbors and to doing other things basically using the goats as a land improver as a success as a vegetative succession um, a catalyst on on other acreage um, otherwise Otherwise, right when, right when the goats have created this beautiful, um, you know, beautiful forage-based habitat, um, they they're they're no longer uh, healthy because we're we're feeding them. Or they're eating too rich a material. Now you've talked about hoofed animals and feathered animals. What about uh, fish? We have a question from Pa Bar who says. Your opinion on modern fish farming? Can regenerative and sustainable farming practices be applied to fish farming? I don't address fish farming in the book primarily because we don't we don't um, we don't do fish farming here. We do have recreational fishing. We have lots of ponds, and we have you know uh, uh, catfish and bass and bluegills and the occasional carp. But 
so you know recreational and 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 you know good night of nice largemouth bass is not only fun to catch it's nice to eat too um there are ways that you can so, so fish farming i'm assuming that this question is more the the mylar cage where you actually you know uh, uh it's actually a concentrated animal feeding operation a cafo uh in a pond and and um uh I, you know i'm i'm not big on that but but let me just because i'm not a i'm not a fan of cafos whether they're you know terrestrial or aquatic um but but i will i will say this that um that and generally we don't think of of fish as being you know domestic livestock but uh i will say this that there are things that you can do to enhance um even even a, a situation an open pond situation let's say you've got bass and bluegills okay uh there are things that you can do to enhance their feeding and their habitat for example if you are um raising you know uh, chickens and and things you're going to have mortalities and um you can float a bucket with holes in the bottom that you pour guts and and dead things in. I mean, even roadkill. Okay, imagine you, know, you go pick up a deer or whatever. The flies will come and lay eggs in it, and the maggots then will fall out through the holes in this in this floating tub and feed fish underneath. Um, so so there are there are definitely things you can enhance. You can float you can float gardens. Uh, you know, you can get a bunch of six foot. We have a raft, for example, with you know, uh, six inch PVC, it's 10, 10 feet by 10 feet, and six inch PVC pipes make a raft, and you can put some compost and soil on top of it. Just make a, you know, a wooden, a wooden uh, border around it, a wooden fence that you can put about six or seven, maybe eight inches of, of soil and compost on it. And uh, you can grow plants in there and let it float on your pond, and, um, and that provides shade for the fish. So they can stay cooler, and that helps them to stay more comfortable. But all those roots go down between the um, the, the PVC pipes because the ends are going to be about a about a quarter inch. So you got about a half inch space, you know, a quarter plus a quarter is half an inch. So you got about a, a half inch space, which is enough room for those roots to go down. Well, they get snails on them and 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 highly oxygenated uh, uh, interface. And so the fish can come along and eat snails and things off of those rootlets of, the, of your plants. And um, and one of the things one of the things that we've learned doing this is that that uh, bug prone things like broccoli um, and cabbage grow in there with no bugs at all because the bugs uh, get eaten by the fish, you know, on their way trying to get out there because you basically surround your you know your floating garden with a you know with a with a moat and uh, and so uh, there are things that you can do to enhance. Uh, I mean, you could, uh, I mean, I have a neighbor, for example, that has a, a bug light. He, he just ran a cord down to his ponds next to his house, and he just has a bug light out there, and all the mosquitoes and flies and things, uh, wa- uh, moths and things that come into that at night, uh, they hit it, and, you know, it shocks them, and they fall to the water, and the fish just feed under that light, you know, uh, all night long. Ah, uh, bug zapper. I get it. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a, a bug zapper. Uh. Uh-huh. Interesting. Uh, now you, you've spoken with us uh, recently about you better get your food security figured out now. There's been a lot of concern, and we just interviewed an expert from inside the trucking industry talking about the major disruptions that have happened to the global supply chain, as well as uh, even within each, you know, within our country and so on. Uh, and people are concerned about unintended dependency on far away, far flung, long supply chains. And that whole idea about going local, eat local, know your farmer, all that. This question comes from that. GridRebellion.com says, how dependent is Joel on outside inputs to his farm? What are his thoughts on supply shortages like feed and inflation going forward? And what do he and other farmers should do to prepare for this? Uh, what a great, what a great question. So, yeah, there, there's several kind of themes to the answer. I think the first one is we are not um, totally independent, 
and in the big scheme of things, we don't even intend to be. Uh, we we want to practice what we call mutual interdependence, but it's not global as much as it's local. There, there's a big difference in being in two neighbors collaborating on something versus me being dependent on something from, you know, 2,000 miles away. And so, for example, the feed that we get for our chickens and pigs and turkeys, the omnivores, the grain that we purchase is coming from uh, a primarily Amish Mennonite uh, farmers locally, and, and it's all GMO-free. So it's GMO-free, so they can keep their own seeds if they need to. They can plant from their own seeds. They're completely outside that whole you know, patented um, system. They're beyond the clutches of Monsanto and Bayer and whatever. And, um, and, and, and they're local. Uh, many of them don't even have a truck. They actually come to the, come to the little the mill we use, which is also a, an Amish Mennonite mill, um, or owned by an Amish Mennonite family. Um, and, and, I, and I know that I'm, I'm if, if you have an Amish or a Mennonite listener, they're, they're all chagrined right now because I'm combining the two and they, they make big differentiation between the two, but uh, I, I'm not, I'm just going to say, you know, Anabaptist. And, uh, and so this mill um, uh, is, you know, is getting their grain here uh, locally. And so we are helping these local farmers stay in business by uh, giving them an extra 50 cents a bushel for their grain. So they're thrilled, and we're thrilled that it's close. We can go visit the farms, and uh, many of them don't even have a truck. They just they just bring it down, you know, pull their, their grain buggy with their tractor and, and bring it down So to the mill. So, you know, that that's about as, as close and tight a loop as you can – as you can uh, string, the one place uh, I would say it, that we're where we're the most vulnerable is in energy, and we have you know we are not uh, you know we're not mechanical geniuses here. We have looked at solar; uh, it, it's problematic. I mean, we we run four walk-in freezers. We store hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of inventory, frozen meat. And and so we have a we have a pretty big power bill, and the uh, to do that with solar uh, gets gets pretty sticky, um, and and so we have not gone that route. Um, we have you know we have we have 700 acres of forest, and what we would love to see is is something using either, you know, large-scale wood gasification or a wood-fired steam engine. Um, I'd love to have a, a little steam engine here that we could, you know, that we could fire up with wood. Um, there's just, there's, we just, um, I mean, the other thing that we, we'd really like to see, I read about a farmer back, I don't know, 30 years ago, and I, I haven't been able to find the article, but, you know, those things you read. And, and this guy uh, put a little a floating windmill on his farm pond to run a, a, an electro, a, a little um, generator to run an electrolysis machine. He had a, uh, a propane tank sitting over on the bank, and through electrolysis, this separated the hydrogen from the, from the w- water, and he ran all of his trucks and his tractors and farm equipment on the hydrogen uh, that he generated from his farm pond, and of course, when when the exhaust comes out, it just it just makes water. When the hydrogen uh, you know goes with oxygen, the the downside of that is that he could only because hydrogen can only be compressed so far. Um, he had to you know refill his tractors about every two hours of running. But you know I would be very happy to do that to have to have free energy. While I consider energy our most vulnerable. Uh, uh, Point right now, we have run analysis on the amount of energy we use, and we use about one tenth of the energy of normal farms for the same level of production. And so, right now, we're just happy that we're that conservative on our energy use, and we hope that if we're the last guy standing, uh, something will be invented, you know, before. <laughs> 
before the last guy standing goes down. That, that's a kind of fatalistic view to it. But I, mean, I think there's some there, there's a little bit of you know, a little bit of common sense in that, and uh, and and so you know we'll see where we are. But um, do we have vulnerabilities? Well, certainly. But you know, somebody asked me once. They said, you know, to you. What does everything falling apart look like? In other words, if you had to describe what does it mean for the culture to fall off the cliff, uh, my answer was you can't get electricity, you can't get fuel, and you can't get grain. If you can't get grain, fuel, or electricity, things will come to a screeching halt. And I guess my, my point is if that ever if that ever happened, things would be so different I mean, we we wouldn't be running delivery trucks to Washington D.C. to our customers. Uh, we'd be out here setting snares and traps to to catch a, a deer or a or a a squirrel to eat. You know, <laughs> we we'd be out here with a hack axe and a hatchet. You know, uh, we, we'd we'd all move into one house and uh, huddled around the fireplace. You know, it, it <laughs> it's post-apocalyptic stuff. And and while that's that's possible, uh, 